Blessed be God, holy, glorious, and undivided Trinity. And blessed, blessed be God's reign, now, now and forever. Amen. God be with you. Let us pray. We're going to do the Kyrie first. Okay. All right. We're doing the Kyrie first. God be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant us, Lord, not to be anxious about earthly things, but to love things heavenly. And even now, while we are placed among things that are passing away, to hold fast to those that shall endure. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Proverbs. A capable wife who can find. She is more precious than jewels. The heart of her husband trusts in her and he will have no lack of gain. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. She seeks wool and flax and works with willing hands. She is like the ships of the merchant. She brings her food from far away. She rises what, while it is still night and provides food for her household and tasks for her servant girls. She considers a field and buys it. With the fruit of her hands, she plants a vineyard. She girds herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff, and her hands hold a spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid for her household when it snows, for all her household are clothed in crimson. She makes herself coverings. Her clothing is fine linen and purple. Her husband is known in the city gates taking his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them. She supplies the merchant with sashes. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she laughs at the time to come. She opens her mouth with wisdom, and the teaching of her kindness is on her tongue. She looks well to the ways of her household, and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children rise up and call her happy, her husband too, and he praises her. Many women have done excellently, but you surpassed them all. <laughs> Sorry.
Charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Give her a share in the fruit of her hands and let her works praise her in the city gates. Hear, <clears throat> hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The response from Psalms will be read in unison. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the ways, nor sat in the seats of the storm. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like the trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like a chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked shall not stay upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. A reading from the book of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness, born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are at war within you? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and conflicts. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly in order to spend what you get on your pleasures. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus went on with his disciples to the village of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Pardon me, this is a morning I'm all over. Okay, we'll try it again, okay? Jesus and his disciples went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples saying to them, the son of man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him and three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying and were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum and when he was in the house, he asked them, what were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they were for they on the way they had argued with one another who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all, and servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not me but the one who sent me. The word of our Savior. Praise to you, Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I like that other gospel too, but uh, <laughs> since I'm preaching on this gospel, I wanted to make sure we heard it. It was a dark time. There were Visigoths pillaging the capital. There was a pandemic raging throughout the land and people had a sense that life was out of control, that things might be collapsing. There was immorality. People were concerned about the slide into selfishness and it was worrisome. People were at high alert and high anxiety. If that sounds familiar to you, I'm actually talking about the year 571. During the last gasp of the Roman Empire, when there was all that going on, there was the actual literal Visigoths pillaging Rome. <laughs> there, was, there was a pandemic going on, and there was this sense of, of just life out of control. In response, there were lots of different things. People were sort of arming themselves, sort of forming little sort of pockets of, of armed troops that later became the warrior chieftains of the early Middle Ages. But a young man had a different response to that situation. His name was Benedict. And he looked at the world out of control and decided that he wanted to just give up for a while. So he became a hermit for about three years, lived by himself in a cave. And as he prayed by himself, he came to the conclusion that living alone was not the answer. And so he began to form a community of like-minded people who were looking to return to a life of simplicity and faithfulness and holiness. It was the beginning of what we know today as the monastic movement. St. Benedict, the founder of a whole line of monks and nuns calling themselves Benedictines, they still exist today. There are Benedictine Episcopalian monks in a couple of places around the country, monks and nuns, who live that life of austerity and simplicity and community. Benedict's response was to go back to the basics. And he created a way of living called the rule of St. Benedict. We don't like the word rule, but it was basically a guidebook for how to live, how his monks and nuns should live in community. And it was full of very ordinary basic stuff like clean up after yourselves, share the labor, 
Over time, the pattern of Benedictine life came to be known, as John reminded me this morning, as ora et labora, prayer and work. And the Benedictine day then and now was divided into times of prayer and times of work and times of rest and refreshment. That rhythm, that balance, that simplicity is, I gotta say, deeply appealing to me as I feel the world often spinning out of control. There's great wisdom in that simplicity. It's the wisdom that our scriptures are talking about today because those same stresses that existed in 571 also existed at the time of Proverbs and the time of James and Jesus and the time that we live in today. Generation after generation, the world bombards us with all kinds of craziness. We get overwhelmed. I mean, I don't know about you, but I love my technology. I have my, my Apple Watch and my iPad and my iPhone and my computer, and all of those devices shout at me constantly. They tap me on the wrist. They ping at me, telling me a new crisis has just arisen. Quick, panic. There's a new crisis, one after another after another. Or sometimes it's just good stuff. You might want to buy this thing, right? This is the latest, greatest thing that you should buy. All of that just sweeps me into this constant mode of kind of anxiety. I, that's the only word I can use, this constant state of feeling unsettled and not sure where to turn. And so I listen to these scriptures and I think about this deep yearning I have to find simplicity. I think it is the antidote to so much of the craziness of life. It's not something new. It's been going on since the beginning of time. And yet, I do think the world in some ways keeps accelerating. James is writing to a community that is struggling to find wisdom. James is frustrated by what he sees as the gap between the way the church should be and the way it actually is. And he talks about our human sinfulness, our desire for envy and selfish ambition. You know, ambition is good, but selfish ambition, ambition which takes over our lives and dominates us, throws us out of balance and makes our life not worth living. Simplicity is the secret to find wisdom in the ordinary things of life. And Jesus walking with his disciples, you know, I often think if I were one of the disciples and I got to spend three years just hanging out with Jesus, listening to Jesus, watching Jesus, I would be the holiest person in the world. Don't you think so? I mean, gosh, how privileged those disciples were. And yet it turns out the disciples were still just like us. Hearing what Jesus was saying, they were arguing about who was the greatest, which of the 12 would be number one and on down the line. They were still subject, despite their time with Jesus, to envy and selfish ambition. Their lives felt out of control, just like ours do. They needed to be taught a lesson. And so Jesus says, hey, let me bring, and I love this on the first Sunday of Sunday school, he brought a child into their midst and said, if you can't welcome this child, you are not welcoming me. If you can't welcome this child with all of its innocence and simplicity and powerlessness, you're not welcoming God, the one who sent me. To welcome God is to welcome the children, even when they make noise, especially because that is their life, right? That is who we are as God's people, welcoming all of God's children. There is a, a modern rule of St. Benedict. You might have read it some years ago. It was, uh, it was uh, not a, exactly written for monks and nuns, but written for the rest of us. It was called, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Do you remember that book? Robert Fulgham. He took a life that seemed crazy and he said, you know, if we really think about it, we make as adults life so complicated, but really life is simple. Think back to the lessons that you learned 
either from your parents or your kindergarten teacher. I remember vividly my kindergarten teacher, Mrs. Werner. Mrs. Werner was a saint. She had had a full career as a public school teacher. She retired, and then she came back to help start an Episcopal elementary school at my parish in Los Angeles. She led all kinds of activities. She taught kindergarten. She also ran all kinds of programs for the kids. She was amazing. And I still remember the things I learned from her, but mostly I learned that she loved me and cared about me and that my life was important to her. That's the gift that the greatest teachers know, that you can't teach unless there is first love. No information can be imparted unless there is a relationship. Well, anyway, Fulgham writes in his wonderful rule of St. Benedict for the 20th century that life really is simple, right? That lessons that we need to live a simple life are these. When you make a mess, clean up after yourself. When you go out into the world, hold hands and make sure that you look both ways. And my favorite one is make sure every day to have milk and cookies and take a nap. <laughs> Let's imagine a world where all of us every day have milk and cookies, unless you're lactose intolerant, you can substitute your own beverage. Milk and cookies and take a nap. What if we could have and find the simplicity that makes for a life of real contentment and happiness and joy. That's what our scriptures are pointing us toward. We make life complicated because of the incessant need of our egos. But if we can tune that out and recover our groundedness in God, if we can welcome the child within us as well as the child in our midst, maybe we can recover a sense of balance, a sense of meaning, a sense of purpose and hope, even in the darkest time. It turns out that St. Benedict, in his rule, in his community, had no idea about this, but he provided the actual structure which kept Europe going during the Dark Ages. When government fell apart, when society fell apart, it was those monasteries that preserved culture and language and learning. It was those monasteries that became the places people went to be treated for illness. It was those monasteries which trained the future leaders who carried on civilization in Europe for many, many years to come. It was Benedict, not Caesar, not any of the great people of his time, Benedict grounded in his relationship with God, Benedict following Jesus, Benedict putting aside ego for the good of the community who provided the answer to the darkest of times. May we have his spirit, the spirit of James, of Jesus, of Robert Fulgham, and of uh, the Holy Spirit to ground us in God and give us the wisdom that comes from simplicity. Amen. Amen. Please rise as you're able as we recite the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became human. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who had spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. For the prayers of the people. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church, that we, that we all may be one. one. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name be We pray for Michael, our presiding bishop, Bonnie, our bishop, Wendell and Stuart, our retired bishops, Eric, Anne, and John, our priests, Moises, bishop of the Dominican Republic, Lutheran bishops, Elizabeth, Donald and Craig, our diocesan household, especially St. Stephen's in Troy and Church at the Crossroads in Detroit. In the Dominican Republic, the Church of the Incarnation in La Romagna and Moises, their bishop, and for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacrament. We pray for Blakely Beth, who is preparing for baptism. We pray for Joel, our president, Gretchen, our governor, the Congress and Supreme Court, and for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. That our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on and for those commended to our prayers, especially Lois, Renee, Renee Carl, Carl, Merv and Rose, Rose Sylvia, Sylvia, Brian, Catherine, Gregory, Gregory Karen, Karen John and Virginia, Elise, Audra and Dick, Christy, Kathy and Gus, Marge, Sarah, Elise, Rob and Sue, Jane, Barbara, Rebecca and children, Wilma, Catherine, Jerry, Olga, Jan, Al, Jimmy, Jill and Ian, Carol, John, David, Scott, Layla, Henry and Sheila, Kathy, Matthew, David, Ryan, Rick, Sharon, Paul, Andy, and those we name now. and all those who suffer from any grief or trouble, that they may be delivered from their distress. For first responders, on those serving in the armed forces, especially Ryan, Ryan Trace, Trace, Stephanie, Stephanie Dylan, Dylan, Matthew, Ian, and Dan. Remembering the departed we name now, Give to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share your communion. 
Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of our Savior, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you. Forgive you all of your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Anniversaries this week, baptisms. John? Birthday, yours? Good, John Higgins, birthday. <laughs> Party at your house? <laughs> okay, let us together uh, recite the anniversary prayer. Gracious and loving God, in you we live and move and have your being. Your love gives us life and sustains all of our relationships. Look with favor, we pray, on these your servants as they remember and celebrate all the anniversaries of their lives, including their birth, baptism, marriage, ordination, and others. Especially this week, Rick, sustain them with your bountiful spirit and grant them the grace to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart in this life and in the life to come through Jesus Christ, our Savior, amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let's share a sign of that peace. No problem. Please be seated for a moment. Good morning and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. We're super glad if you are visiting with us for the first time and hope you'll uh, join us for refreshments after church. We're gonna try it outside while the weather's nice to have coffee hour outside. If you would like to sign up to help with coffee hour, you would make Bishop Kimo extremely happy. Um, Bishop Kimo, would you raise your hand so people know? This is, this is the person he and Jana have taken over uh, leading coffee hour, but they don't wanna provide coffee hour every week. So there is a sign up online or you can speak to him or to me after church so that we can have fellowship uh, after church at the 10 o'clock service. Today is also the beginning of Sunday school. We're really glad that that's happening. Uh, at times I wondered if we were gonna be able to do it. So uh, pray for the Sunday school and for Bev and all the teachers they're meeting at 9.45 each Sunday downstairs, and then coming up right around this time in the service, right around 10.30 or so, and rejoining their families uh, for the rest of church. That'll be our uh, way going forward. In a couple weeks, we are having an extra special Sunday with all kinds of stuff happening. On October 3rd, we will have our normal eight o'clock service. At 9 a.m., we're having a baptism, and at 10 o'clock is the blessing of the animals. So bring your well-behaved pets to church that day. If you have a vicious animal, we recommend you leave it home. But uh, I, I know we all love our pets, but uh, we've had a wonderful time with that service in the past and we'll do it again. It's always the Sunday closest to St. Francis Day, which this year is October 4th. So October 3rd, Sunday at 10 a.m. is the blessing of the animals. We have a number of classes coming up. Today's class is uh, watching and then talking about a PBS series called The Black Church, History of the Black Church in America. Great series. If you haven't watched it, you can join on Zoom and watch at 3 p.m. And then the discussion will also be on Zoom, not here as previously announced, but on Zoom at 6.30 p.m. 
The epistle has uh, some of the details, or if you're interested and don't get the epistle, please speak to me uh, after church. Father John is continuing his class on what do we do about evil from the Franciscan perspective. We had a great first session last Thursday. You can join us this Thursday at 7 p.m. and more events and classes coming up. Uh, follow our website or even better, our weekly newsletter, The Epistle. And if you need to subscribe, you can do that from the website as well. Any other announcements? Laura. All right, let me, let me say that one so people can hear it. 2 p.m. on Thursday is the Altar Guild meeting. That's another wonderful ministry of the church. If you're interested, please do speak to Laura, who's right over there. That's 2 p.m. Thursday. So just a reminder, I forgot about it. The Brooksy Way is next Sunday, and it does impact Rochester. So do look at the course and see if your route to or from church will be affected. <laughs> Yes, John. Speak right into the microphone. Yeah, yeah. Wait, we have a new carpet selected for the altar area. And I need about eight strong guys without bad backs to pick these guys up and move them over there, replace the carpet and come back. So. I just want to whet your appetite. You know, you want to be there for this one. <laughs> so I, will, I would like it if people would call me to get on the list because we got to move. These are monsters, so it's like a hearse. <laughs> That's all I have. We'll get back with that. You will, you will love it, I'm sure. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God.
I invite you to stand as you're able. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious God, in your infinite love you made us for yourself, and when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and preserver of all people. Jesus stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Savior Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, Almighty God, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink, of new and unending life in Christ. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through Jesus Christ, our Savior, by Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
The gifts of God for the people of God, holy gifts for holy people.
Let us pray. Eternal God, you have graciously accepted us as living members of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Savior. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.